Okay, so now let's use the rules developed in the previous video to compute the durations of several bonds. Okay, the first application is the duration of a fixed coupon bond, right? So things now will become very simple given the rules that we have. What is a fixed coupon bond? Well, a fixed coupon bond is just a portfolio of zero coupon bonds. So I'm going to apply the two rules before and say that the duration of the portfolio, which now is a coupon bond, is just the weighted average of the durations of the bonds in the portfolio. Okay, what are the bonds in the portfolio? Are zero coupon bonds. And the duration of each zero coupon bond is just what you see here, the time until maturity of that zero coupon bond, meaning the time until the payment of that coupon, right? And the weight is what? The weight is the value of the coupon divided by the value of the total bond, right? Example, so, so let's say a portfolio manager has $2 million, $10 million invested in a one-year treasury bond paying 4% semi-annually, okay? And again, the, the same type of question as before, by how much will the value change, the portfolio value change, meaning the bond price change if interest rates increase by one basis point. Okay, so now we are given the spot rates uh, for the maturities of the coupons, namely uh, six months and one year. And uh, the rates are in continuous compounding. So 1% for six months, 1.2% for one year. All right. So let's uh, compute this, these numbers. So this is the timeline. Okay. The, the bond will pay these coupons here. 4% divided by 2. 4% divided by 2 plus face value at six months and one year. These are the discount rates. Okay. So let's first compute the bond price as usual present value of the cash flows, right? And then the duration is, again, the weighted average of the durations of these coupons, okay? The first coupon is a zero coupon bond of six months, so it has a, a duration of those same six months, or 0 0.5 years. And the, the final coupon, no, not coupon and face value, this whole thing is a zero coupon bond with a duration of one year, okay? And now the weights. Well, the weights are what? The, the weights are the value of those cash flows. So, for example, this whole thing here is here, divided by the value of the portfolio, which in this case is the bond itself, right? And likewise for the second cash flow. So it's this whole thing divided by the bond price. So that gives me a duration of 0.99 years, right? So uh, if we look here at the timeline, the duration would be very close here to the to the final cash flow, okay? Because this is a weighted average, and this cash flow obviously has much more weight than this one, right? Because this is much bigger; it has the, the full face value here. So even though it is an average, since it is weighted, it's going to be very close to the to the element that has more weight, okay? So 0 0.99, 0 0.99, around here as it should be, right? And then the, 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 the question as before, the change in the portfolio value will be approximately equal to the duration times the value times the change in interest rates. Again, we assume uh, an increase of one basis point. So if interest rates go up, the bond price goes down by this amount. Okay. Second example, a duration, the duration of a floating rate bond. Okay. So again, uh, we're just going to use the rule that we developed before because this, even though it looks complicated, it, actually, it is actually very simple. And uh, let, let me jump directly to the example. What is the duration of a 1.4 year floating rate bond? So first, 1.4 year means the maturity date as of today. Okay, so it will reach maturity in 1.4 years. And the bond pays annual coupons at LIBOR 12 months, right? So let's look at the, at the timeline. <coughs> Not this one. This one, okay? So this is the timeline. Again, maturity in 1.4 years. Since the coupons are annual, I will have another coupon in uh, 0 0.4 years, all right? And now it's the usual setup of a floating rate bond, meaning I know what is the next coupon. It's going to depend on the value of the index, in this case, the LIBOR, uh, 
at the last reset date, which will have been uh, 0.6 years ago, so somewhere back here. Okay, so I look up the value of the LIBOR there, and I, I can determine this index. So this is known. But the index after that is not known, it's random, hence this tilde here, because it will depend on the LIBOR at 0 0.4, right? So this is unknown, the cash flow is unknown, and there's no way of knowing it. But uh, as we have seen before, I don't need to know this, this cash flow, because uh, using the, the arguments we developed in this and on the section of um, bond pricing, we know that this amount here, this whole amount here, is worth 100% at the next reset date. Okay, regardless of the value of the LIBOR, I always use the same LIBOR uh, as the numerator and the denominator, and therefore the two cancel out and I get 100%. Okay, we have seen this argument before. So the point is that even though this is a, 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 an asset whose cash flows are unknown, I don't need to know them because I know that the price is going to be 100% at 0.4. So I can forget about these cash flows and I can look at this floating rate bond as a simple zero coupon bond that is going to pay everything at 0.4, right? 100% plus this index, which is known, okay? And I, I, I don't even have to bother to go back in time and look at the value of the library because at, I'm just asking what is the duration? Well, if this is a zero coupon bond, the duration is the time until the payment of the cash flow, right? So even though this is a floating rate that will go on for many more periods, the duration is very simply the time until the next reset date, until the next coupon. All right. And that's, that's this formula that you have here. All right. Okay, uh, uh, let's generalize this a little bit. So now let's consider a floating rate bond that also has a spread. All right. And again, let's do this with, a, with an example instead of looking at the formulas. Uh, so let's compute the duration of a two-year floating rate bond, paying annual coupons at LIBOR 12 months, but now also with this spread here. Okay, so this is what's different relative to the previous case. Right? Let's assume that we are just one instant after the last coupon was paid, and let's assume that the term structure is flat at 4%. These are rates with annual compounding. Okay. Um, this is not terribly clear, but uh, what, what this also means is that the, the LIBOR 12 months right now is 4%. So the next coupon is going to be 4%, right? So let's compute the, the duration of this bond. For example, 3 to 5. Okay, so this is a bit messy, but let me let's uh, try to go through this. Okay, it's a two-year bond, floating rate bond with spread, meaning that the coupon is going to be the value of the index plus the spread. The value of the index, 4%, is determined at the last reset date, and I just said that it is 4%, okay? So this is known. The next coupon, is depending on the is going to depend on the value of the LIBOR at time one, so it is unknown, it's random. But there is a spread which is known, it's 0 0.5, that does not change, plus the face the face value. Okay. So let's again use the arguments uh, that we have seen before to conclude that this part here in red, so the face value and the index, but not including the spread, is worth 100 percent at the next reset date. All right. So what did I do? Well, I took care of the random part. So now I have circled here in black a fixed rate uh, payment. It's 100%, 4%, 0.5%. So there is nothing here that is floating. It's perfectly fixed, known. And uh, I have a second part here, smaller one, but also fixed, 0.5%. All right. So what does this look like? Well, this just looks like a stream of fixed payments. So again, I can use the, the two rules that we have developed. All right. So in steps, uh, let's first compute the bond price, which is the present value of this cash flow, 
104.5 here. Discounted at the rate of 4%, which was the, the, the spot rate for one year. Plus the second part here, 0.5%. Discounted at the spot rate for two years, which we are assuming the same because we said the term structure was flat, okay? The same rate for all maturity, so 4% for two years as well. And that gives me the bond price, okay? And then the duration is just the weighted average of the individual durations, and the individual durations, since these are zero coupon bonds, this is a zero coupon bond, this is another zero coupon bond, it's just the time to maturity of those bonds. So, uh, the first, let's think of this as the first zero coupon bond. The, mat the, the maturity is one year, therefore the duration is one year. This is the second zero coupon bond at two years, so that's, their, that's the duration. And then the weights are again, the, this is a weighted average, so the weights are the natural weights in the sense that it is the value of that first payment, this whole payment here, 104.5 discounted, this whole thing, divided by the total portfolio value, which in this case is the bond itself, right, divided by B0. And likewise, for this small payment here, which is here, the, the, the value is here, or here, divided by the bond price, okay? And that gives me the duration of the floating rate bond. All right. Um, So I'm not going to do this uh, this second example here, this three to six, three to six here in, in the video, but uh, please go through this. This is just to 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 show that this is correct, so that you can compute a duration like this and do the similar type of exercise as we have seen before and come up with a reasonable approximation to the to the bond price for a given change in interest rates. So what this is asking you to do is to estimate the 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 price change using the, exactly the same rules as we have seen in previous examples and uh, then check that it, this is actually a good approximation by computing the true, the true price, the true um, price of the floating rate bond with the new rates. Okay, and the, the, two, the two numbers are very close as you can see here. So uh, the formula is correct. It gives you a good approximation for changes in, in prices, All right? Um, and by the way, this is also um, a good example to show the following. So going back to the to the PDF here. So if this this is a floating rate bond, okay? This is a floating rate bond. This is what is really going to happen. If I buy the bond, I'm going to get the face value only at time two, okay? We did all these arguments and concluded that the duration is one year. So it's something around here, around one, it's one plus a little bit, so slight, slightly to the right of one year, okay? If this was a fixed rate bond with two years to maturity, we would have concluded, as we did in previous examples, that the duration would be an average of these two numbers, but very skewed to the right, right? Because this is the one that would be more, more heavy, it would be a number like 1.9, right? What we are finding now, with, since this is a floating rate bond, is that even though the face value is only going to be paid at the end, the duration is very small. It's, it's on, on, the other, on the other point of the interval. It's very close to one, all right? Uh, so this shows you that duration, uh, as uh, people uh, wrongly say sometimes, duration is not really a measure of time, okay? Even though it comes in units of time, this is not a, a, a meaningful way of describing the time until payments of the of the cash flow or something like that. So even though that is true for fixed rate bonds, it is not true in general. And as you can see here, with a floating rate bond, the duration is close to one. So it's not uh, related to the to to the two years when we will actually get the face value. Right? It's a very low number because what duration is, is not a measure of time. It's really what we defined in the beginning. That is, duration is a measure of the sensitivity of the bond price to changes in, inter in interest rates. And the point of a floating rate bond is to be very smooth, very stable, very insensitive, not sensitive to changes in interest rates. That's why the duration is low, because this 
bond, this floating rate bond, will not change by much, even with a large interest rate change. Okay, and this is a measure of risk. This is telling us that the the bond is not very sensitive to changes in interest rates. All right. Um, so there are here a few other comments about uh, durations. You can read about this uh, and let me know if you have any questions about this later on. All right, I'll stop here.